با سلام به دوستان عزیز در هر جا که هستند دوستانی که الان تش دارند و دوستانی که در آینده این برنامه رو خواهند دید Greetings to everyone uh, those who are here in the audience and those who will be watching this program in its taped form. Uh, I would like to first and foremost welcome the panelists uh, who have uh, accepted our invitation and uh, done a very difficult job of trying to help us organize a conference during uh, Corona time. Uh, I am very grateful to Professor Kamshad who uh, worked incredibly hard to prepare this remarkable collection of MESCO papers uh, and uh, uh, decided to uh, donate them to Stanford University. Uh, we are very grateful for uh, his help in all of this. Uh, in this process, uh, Ms. Kasmai was extremely helpful to me, particularly in navigating some of the uh, minor obstacles that had uh, been created. So I'm grateful to both of them. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Roma Parhat and uh, Franco Enrico, who have really done the major part of the work in organizing uh, and bringing this conference together. This conference has been almost a year and a half in the making. We were hoping to meet last spring on Stanford campus, but because of Corona, we decided to delay it and then decided that we can delay it no longer. But they have done the remarkable work of bringing all of us together and uh, uh, doing this uh, uh, on Zoom conference. Once the papers were here, we were very, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Perkins as the curator of the Middle East section at Stanford. Uh, he has been uh, an enormous help to Iranian studies uh, since his uh, coming on board as the director of the uh, Middle East uh, holdings of the library. Uh, we have uh, seen an enormous improvement in our holdings and in the way our students and our faculty are served. So. Uh, if, without any further ado, uh, I turn the uh, uh, event to him who will be managing this uh, event. Uh, Dr. Perkins teaches uh, on East Asia at Stanford while also curating the Middle East section. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor Malani, and thank you for all of you who have, who have joined in. Mon Khali Khushalam, Ozdidan Shuma. And I hope that we will have a very uh, engaged conversation today. So as uh, Dr. Malani mentioned, uh, to the, due to the hard work of uh, Professor Hassan Kamshad and his family, we received the archive of Sharukh Maskoub. And what I would like to do is show a little, we've been able to create a spotlight exhibit. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here where and give you a little sample uh, of the archive and what we have created with this exhibit. So first of all, if you go to exhibits.stanford.edu, you will see a list of all these different exhibits. And then you will see this, the life and work of Shadow Maskoub, a personal archive. And if you click on that, it will then take you to the home page here. And so far we have divided the collection into personal correspondence. So this would include letters, personal letters, drafts, um, and notes. So if you click on personal correspondence, you will see a number of letters that have been digitized. Um, and I think this is going to be a tremendous resource for people. And again, this is in the early stages. So we plan on digitizing much of the collection and adding more and more items to this collection. Um, so if we want to view all of them at one time, you can go to view 50 per page and we can see the different various personal letters uh, to Maskoub and from Maskoub. And if we want to go back and explore, let's say notes, we'll see some of the materials that we've been able to, to upload here. And if you click on any of these items, you'll then, it will take you to another page where you can then scroll through the materials um, and you can zoom in as well. So I encourage all of you, um, especially after the, the panel today, 
Um, no one here has like, I mean, apart from Professor Milani, when we were going through some of the materials, this is the first time this has just been launched live. So you are the first ones to actually see this exhibit. And no one who is presenting today has utilized any of these materials, but uh, we wanted to celebrate the launching of this archive, particularly with this panel. So um, without further ado, I thought we can get started with as many of you viewing this, you have asked, uh, sent in your questions. And so what I'm going to be doing is asking uh, different panelists some of the questions that you have sent in. And I see that you are also sending in questions live and we'll do our best to get to those as well. So maybe the first question that um, I would like to ask, um, and there is no particular order um, that I'm that I'm going through, um, but maybe for uh, Professor Mahram Bazai. So one of the questions that came in is in Maskoub's interviews with the magazine Kitab and Rose in the 19 in the 50s, we witness that, for example. Mr. Bazai has issues with the way Maskoub interpreted the Shah Naume. To what extent do you, Mr. Bazai, who has a particular social and personal interpretation, agree with Maskoub's analysis? And to what extent do you believe this analysis paves the way for better understanding? Uh, I wish to speak in Persian uh, because I'm uh, speaking with uh, my uh, spectators in Iran. And Darbari, Magali, Manavisham, Raja, the Ore Mesku, Hamso Ali Shomoro, Jarok Midam, Bahamik So Alike, Azam Shuda as Iran. قبل از هر چیز بگم من به هر روشن فکری یا تفکری که خودش تبدیل به نوعی تلقین و سانسور نشده احترام میگذارم میخواین ترجمه کنید I'm going to speak uh, uh, in uh, Farsi because uh, some of the uh, audience is uh, in Iran and uh, I feel uh, more comfortable talking in Persian I'm going to talk about my article uh, about my scoop I'm going to answer your question and at the same time, answer another question that has been sent to me from Iran. I want to begin by emphasizing that I respect every intellectual whose thoughts are not uh, dictated a priori or whose thoughts have not been censored. I respect them all. Uh, uh, in my essay, I, I think uh, I uh, make clear that I think it's a uh, uh, welcome uh, paradox, it's a welcome change that some of the Iranian intellectuals of the leftist persuasion have begun to work directly on Shahnameh and uh, uh, Ferdowsi. As what I'm saying, for Sidi Shudek, who joined in Mohammed about Shahnameh, that John Bishop Neveshte Shudek. چند تا جواب داره جواب اولش اینه که در هیچ جا هیچ چیز که به حل مشکلی واقعی و جاری بیانجامد هیچ جا نوشته نشده و همه موکول است به آینده ای از جمله در جنبش چپ که استبداد کارگری آینده است one question has been asked where has it been uh, that uh, some people of the left have written something in opposition to Shah Naumeh. I have to say very clearly, categorically, nowhere. Nowhere has this been written because every engagement with this has been uh, relegated to a future where the dictatorship of the proletariat will come. So uh, how do we understand that in the community of the community of the community? As I said, the community of the community. Uh, so the, the question is, how do we then know that there has been this opposition to Shah uh, We know it from uh, those who have been trained by this uh, 
ideology, those who have been trained by the ideology of the party. And for that, I have hundreds of examples. برترین نمونه اون رو در مقالم اس بردم برترین ها برترین نام های اون رو در مقالم اس بردم مگر کمه فقط یک کتاب رو اس ببرم کتاب فریدونیان زحاکیان و, مز... و مردمیان کتابی در تمسخر استور فردوسی به زبان جاهلی فین فارسی بدون درک پشت سوزن معنی استوره ای که از اون حرف میزنن <تصفيق> Uh, the, the question, uh, I have uh, <clears throat> uh, mentioned some of the most uh, renowned uh, people in this tradition in my article. Uh, and if there is need to uh, have more, I can add more. But as one example, I can name uh, the book, Feriduniano Zahakian. Uh, it it uh, talks about mythology, it talks about uh, Shahnameh, without having the minimum understanding of what mythology is or what the uh, Shahnameh is about. میان نوشته های روشن فکری چپ یک نمونه درخشان ولی هست تماسی داد مال فه میم جوانشیر که عالی با چشم پوشی بر دو اصل خیلی مهم. توجه میکنی؟ بله. Uh, amongst the uh, 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 The writings of the left uh, on this, uh, the good writings, uh, there is the uh, great book by F.M. Jabonchi called uh, uh, The uh, Story of, or the uh, Epic of uh, Justice, uh, although there are two uh, glaring omissions in it, but it is a great book. Yek nadide gireftane mahse istibdad dini dar sarta sar shahname. که مثالش البته هر جا است که در شاهنامه گفته میشه بزرگان و مگر بزرگانی که تو شاهنامه گفته میشه کیان و کی داشتیم بزرگتر از موبدان the first glaring absence is uh, uh, not uh, looking at the references to uh, religious despotism in شاهنامه every time in شاهنامه it talks about the despotism of the great ones That must be a ref- construed as a reference to religious uh, despotism, because who else other than religious leaders were considered the uh, Bozorgan, the great ones? Uh, and the second one, Uh, is the question of uh, uh, the, the glaring absence is uh, not asking where these kings, these shahs have come from. Are they not from us? Are they not all raised in uh, the, uh, within religious despot- despotism from the times of the Mubadan in the Zoroastrian Iran till the, uh, today in contemporary Iran? <clears throat> من اینجا تموم می کنم چون دو دقیقه ظاهرا شده ولی اگر بعدا لازم باشه من ساعت ها هفت I end my comment here because my, my time my two minute is up uh, but if there is more time later uh, I have much to add to this question <coughs> Thank you uh, Thank you Dr. Mali for your translation and Professor Bozai for, for your answers uh, for your comments. We have other follow-up questions on that, but we can come back to that. Uh, one of the questions that we received was related to the materials at Stanford. Um, so the manuscripts and personal writings of Shadok Maskub have been delivered to Stanford. Um, could you please speak regarding the content and volume of these writings, how they were delivered, whether they were cataloged, and what lies in their future? Is it possible for researchers to gain access to these writings? And Professor Milani, maybe you can speak a little bit to that, and I can speak a little bit about kind of the future and what we hope to do with the rest of these materials. Uh, the documents are uh, cover almost the entire life of uh, the intellectual life of uh, Ms. Coop. He has begun collecting. He had begun collecting everything, almost all the manuscript uh, from as early as the, his time in the to the party where he made a translation. And his very dear friend, uh, Kayvan, for example, made some corrections. He has preserved that. 
all the correspondence that he has uh, written to or has received from, all his notes for his uh, talks, for his uh, books, uh, uh, notes for books that he's never written, uh, and uh, comments that he has written about his readings. All of these are there. Uh, they have been preserved. Uh, Professor Kamshad has gone uh, through all of them and put them in envelopes. When uh, uh, we received it, uh, when uh, Dr. Perkins and I went through it, we received them in several large uh, plastic bags and we sat in his office and went through them. And I was awed, and I think that Dr. Perkins was awed uh, by how extensive they are, how meticulous they have been uh, in keeping, how much hard work uh, uh, has Dr. Kamshad had put in there, uh, putting down all the letters in the one envelope, for example, for letters from Puri Sultani, letters from uh, Kamshad, letters from Yar Shatir. All of these are available. If Green Library was uh, open today, uh, if the university was open today, if we were having this conference on campus today, uh, all of this material would have been open to any researchers. Uh, and as soon as the university opens, I think, and here Dr. Perkins can speak, we are not going to censor anything. We haven't been told by uh, the executor of this uh, collection that anything needs to be kept up. There is a lot of stuff that is going to be extremely fascinating for people who are interested in the life of Ms. Poop. Although I have gone through them uh, in respect to the rights of other scholars, as Dr. Perkins indicated, I haven't used any of that stuff in the material that I presented here. Uh, we should all have equal access to it in equal time. And when the library is available, all of this will be available and you will see that it is truly a remarkable collection along with other collections that we have at Stanford. We have uh, the uh, Golshiri's collections here. We have uh, Zahedi's collections here. We have uh, um, films uh, by the great filmmakers. So the collection is becoming together a fascinating window into modern Iran. Yeah, thank you, Professor Milani. And, and yes, in terms of cataloging um, metadata, um, uh, Mr. Hassan Kamshad, Professor Kamshad has provided some of this metadata. And so we have a team at Stanford at the library who helps to convert this and provide the cataloging the metadata for these materials. And one of the things with COVID, it's emphasized even more how important it is to digitize materials and put them online so that even if the library is not open to the public, that they can be accessible to, to all of you. Um, so maybe another question that uh, just came in here, and maybe I can um, can uh, have this question for um, Professor Sarur Kasmai. Uh, so Maskub is div has divided his Shah Nome teaching um, in speeches, creation, um, and I'm trying to understand this question. So creation, history, from Gaute to Haziz. And what do you think about this classification? Uh, I will translate the question. Ms. Koop, in the beginning of the Shahnameh, a taqsim bandi ایجاد کرده که ایشون دقیقا متوجه سال نبودن ولی ظاهرا تقسیم بندی تقسیم بندی به روایت شاهنامه از آغاز خلقت و زمان تاریخ از آغاز تاریخ ایران آیا شما با این تقسیم بندی موافقید نظرتون در مورد این تقسیم بندی چه the question is about the division between uh, history of creation and then the historical part of شاهنامه am i right زنده یاد مسکوب در کلاس های شاهنامه پاریس که به موازات نگارش کتاب ارمغان مور اجرا می شد همون مطالبی که در واقع در ارمغان مور چکیدش آمده در کلاس شاهنامه پاریس در واقع بیان می شد و سوال های شرکت کنندگان مطرح می شد و گاهی اصلاحاتی درش تصیحاتی می شد و البته خب خیلی به هاشیه می رفتیم برای اینکه دو سال و نیم فرصت داشتیم این مقدم است اگر می بعد وارد هست 
uh, Ms. Coop had a series of classes uh, uh, on Shahnameh in Paris. Uh, I must add that uh, uh, she was the organizers of these uh, uh, two, uh, sessions. So uh, in these, uh, uh, and, uh, these uh, uh, classes were essentially the basis for his posthumously published book, the Armaghan Moor, which is about Shahnameh. Uh, that book is in a sense, the summary of his teachings in these classes where there was occasion for discussion, occasion for revision and rethinking uh, and answering questions, uh, became later uh, what was given in uh, as the final manuscript of the book. Uh, in these, uh, we had two and a half years and there was much more chance to discuss these things. Uh, if I may. این کلاس ها از ابتدا طبق قراری که من و مسکو با هم گذاشته بودیم زبط می شد روی نوار بر این که تعداد شرکت کنندگان فقط پنی نفر بود یعنی ابتدا ده نفر بعد کم کم رسیدیم به پنی نفر و از ابتدا هر دو آگاه بودیم که اهمیت این گفتگوها زیاده و باید که ثبت بشه و بعد به یه شکلی یا به دانشگاه اهدا بشه یا منتشر بشه و چهار سال پیش من موفق شدم که با کمک احمد مسکوب این کلاس ها رو کم کم دیجیتالی کنیم و روی یوتیوب و سایت رادیو فرانسه منتشر کنیم. Uh, from the moment these classes uh, began, uh, there was an, an agreement between Ms. Kub and I that we should uh, record these. Uh, the number of people in the class was limited and it began with 10, 10 and eventually uh, came down to five. Uh, but we realized that this was important and we realized that we must keep it. And we realized that we must preserve it and eventually donate it to some university. Uh, four years ago, with the help of uh, Mr. Ahmad and Ms. Goop, uh, we turned all of these recordings into a digital form. And with the help of radio, uh, French radio, uh, we broadcast them and uh, we uh, are going to uh, uh, preserve them for posterity. چرا این توضیح رو میدم به خاطر اینکه الان در دسترس این کلاس ها و میشه بهش مراجعه کرد به صورت شنیداری فایل های شنیداری و صدای خود مسکو در این کلاس ها همونطور که در کتاب ارمغان مور مسکو به داستان های شاهنامه نگاه نمیکنه بلکه به اندیشه فردوسی نظر کرده و اندیشه فردوسی رو به پ... یعنی کل کتاب رو به پنج بخش تقسیم کرده پنج تم یا پنج مطلب رو برجسته کرده تو شاهنام The reason I uh, gave this uh, detailed description is because those classes uh, the recording of those classes are now available you can listen to them and you can essentially uh, uh, find what he was uh, talking about in uh, detail. In these discussions, uh, uh, Ms. Kruk never uh, went into retelling of the stories of Shahnameh, but he was instead interested in the underlying thought process or thought structure behind these stories. And in that sense, he divided the entire Shahnameh into five thematics. این پنج تم یکی آفرینش یکی تاریخ دیگری زمان که به نظر مسکوب گرانیگاه اندیشه فردوسی در شاهنامه بخش چهارم جهانداری و آخر سخن که این هم از اهمیت بسیار زیادی از نظر مسکوب برخوردار time and time for uh, him is the pivotal idea in all of Shahnameh, uh, the conduct of the world or management of the world, and finally words or logos. For him, this was of particular importance. In Chekide, 60 years of Mutale Meskub in Shahnameh, that in the book of Armaghan Moor, it was very good. 
و میشه به اونجا مراجعه کرد و به طور دقیق با اندیشه مسکوب آشنا شد This is essentially the essence of his 60 year uh, toiling on the text of Shahnameh and studying the Shahnameh and uh, if you refer to the book Armagan Moor which uh, I understand is now in the process of being translated into English we were having a conversation about it before we began uh, uh, there you can see uh, in very precise language how he has developed these five thematics in his uh, uh, work in Machake. All right, thank you very much for that, uh, for that response. This uh, question is for Professor Ganu uh, Parvar, <coughs> um, or whoever can answer. Given that Maskub has relied upon the Moscow edition of Shah Naume, and now can some consider uh, Khaligi Mutlaq's, uh, the most reliable edition, how should we reconcile the fact that many stories like Tamine's Morning have been eliminated in Khaligi's edition? Uh, I imagine, I think this is the question that uh, Ms. Kasmoy should answer, but uh, I imagine that at the time when Meskoub was doing his work, that was the that was the best available uh, available uh, text. Uh, I would imagine also that if Meskoub was going to uh, do it now, uh, if he were alive, Khaled uh, uh certainly is go, uh, has been considered the uh, you know the best uh, text. Uh, but I, I let uh, Ms. Kasmoy uh, answer that maybe. Thank you very much. Yes, Mesku, in fact, when it started, of course, in the beginning of Armagan Moor, all the people of Khaliqi were not published. Because of the fact that مسکوب در واقع ارجاع میداد به تمام یادداشتهایی که از سالهای پیش روی حتی هاشیه نویسی کرده بود که چاپ نسخه مسکو رو نسخه مسکو خب به تمیزی و به نظر مسکو به تمیزی خالقی مطلق نبود اینه که ما از یک زمانی مسکوب هر دو رفرانس رو میداد یعنی هم به جلت های نشر مسکو رفرانس میداد هم خالقی مطلق این موضوع باعث شده بود که زیر نویسا خیلی زیاد بشه به خاطر همین یه چند جا اشاره میکنه که خالقی مطلق رو بهترین نسخه میدونه ولی اون نسخه کاریش بیشتر نسخه مسکو بوده when uh, he began to uh, uh, write the book uh, Mur, uh, the uh, edition of uh, the entire eight volume edition of Khaliqi Mutla. For those who might not know this, uh, there is an edition of Shah Nameh uh, after the Moscow edition that is now considered the authoritative. And the question is, why did not Mesku refer to that? Uh, the answer is that in the, when he began to write his book, the entire eight volume had not been published yet, uh, but uh, and uh, Mesku was referring uh, repeatedly to his comments, marginal notes uh, that he had written on the Moscow edition, uh, before Khaliqi Mutlaq, that was the authoritative version. Uh, but uh, he was very clear, the scoop was very clear that the best edition now available, the best edition that uh, is currently available is Khaliqi Mutlaq. After a while, he began to make double references. And when there was a re referring to a story, he would both refer to the Moscow edition as well as to the Khaliqi Mutlaq. But we realized that the number of footnotes are, are becoming uh, voluminous and too many. Uh, so, but in several places, he has made it clear that in his mind, the best version available is Khalid Yamatla. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now I'd like to have a question for um, Professor Farooq Fal. Um, you write that he, that Masku was both a contemporary and a Nietzschean posthumous posthumous thinker. From the beginning of his writing career, did he occupy this dual space? Or was there a particular moment 
that he realized that his contemporaries were not only those from his time period? This is the whole question that I try to answer. You know, uh, some guys now belongs to the history of literature, but, uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, you can go and read them. And, but there are some figures that uh, when you read them, you still, you, 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 you feel and you find that there are, uh, uh, speaking to you, uh, to you as uh, as your contemporary, as those uh, guys that uh, it seems that they live uh, in the very moment of present. Uh, if I uh, explain and answer this question, uh, I mean that uh, you know, uh, for example, Shariati is Shariati still your contemporary? No, he is not. Uh, he belongs to the uh, history of uh, a period of intellectual life in Iran. But you can uh, read Moscow just now and you find that how much he is relevant to our situation now. This is what I mean by a contemporary that is still is contemporary as Moscow. And Please refer to my uh, what I quote from Agamben and the other guys to explain uh, such a concept. Uh, and also uh, Mesco, uh, a brilliant definition of uh, contemporariness, you know, uh, 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 going beyond uh, one's own time and synchronized with the future or in future. This is uh, what I uh, explained very, very briefly in my talk. And uh, let me uh, uh, correct a term that I, I don't know why, I wonder why I did re read it uh, uh, not correctly. When I uh, talk about the uh, uh, textual approach of MESCO, I said that one can see his analyt analytical method, a rate trait that one hardly finds in the academic, mostly descriptive, historical, or mere philological. I read by mistake, philosophical. Please uh, consider this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ferofal. Um, <clears throat> the next one is Prof. Uh, as prof Professor um, Monoazizi, you write that this notion of identity was more cultural or linguistic, but Moscow was also an Iranian. Is his nationalism reconcilable with his cultural Persian identity? And if so, how? Well, this was a point that I really tried um, to clarify. Um, the word um, or the phrase cultural identity and Iranianness, from Meskoub's point of view, um, the word that he used in Persian was Oviyate Farhangi. Um, that refers to many aspects of Iranian culture pre-Islamic, post-Islamic, and, and so on. And of course, in that context, his emphasis was on the role of language. I tried to distinguish that, the notion of cultural identity, uh, sometimes even national identity, from a nationalist perspective, which from my point of view is quite different from a uh, cultural identity. Um, the elements that make up the cultural identity of a people are generally speaking passive elements. You know, they're religious elements, there are poetic dimensions, you know, cultural, you know, musical, and, and so on and so forth. Passive in the sense that they're not politically active, if you will, or politically consequential, unless they are made consequential 
by ideologizing them, by putting them into ideologies. And of course, an ideology, a political ideology, goes beyond a simple analysis um, of uh, the elements of cultural identity, for example. Um, you need to stir up passions when you um, use uh, those ideas to form an ideology. Uh, you need to um, promote action uh, by ideologizing um, these notions. This was not what Ms. Cook was interested in um, when he talked about Hoviyete Farhangi. He was more descriptive, if you will, analytical and descriptive in presenting his notion of ideology, not political in the sense of using those elements to mobilize the Iranian people to act this way or that way, or to take this position or that position. So he was not an ideological nationalist in that sense, even though he talked about Iranian national identity, cultural identity, um, and, and so on. This would be my response to, to the question. All right, thank you, Professor. Thank you for that. Um, so another question um, that we have here is um, for um, Professor Malani. Um, in the current publications of Maskub's writing, names are often encrypted and only a few people have full names. Are Mr. Kamshad and the editors of these writings, even for the sake of historical records, thinking about when and how these names will be decrypted and revealed? Uh, I, I don't <clears throat> know the answer to that because, uh, first of all, uh, I haven't gone through, and I don't think you have either, through all the uh, uh, manuscripts we have about those and to see whether in the manuscripts themselves uh, they are revealed. Uh, once they are, uh, if they are, uh, I would think, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we need to abide by the rules. We need to ask uh, the uh, family. Uh, we need to ask the permission of those whose names are there. So th those will entangle us in a series of decisions that are essentially, uh, uh, um, I would think, legal. If he has omitted them, uh, then we need some uh, overwhelming uh, 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 reason to decode them. Uh, am I correct in terms of what the rules are, uh, Ryan? Yeah, so in terms of, so the materials that have been donated, as long as there are no restrictions on them, they can be made available. If the, the materials themselves have something omitted or they're blacked out, there's not a way for us to uncover those unless someone, but anyone will be able to come and look at the physical materials and then that we digitized, but we ourselves don't have special access that would be on what the materials actually have. And when they were given, there were no restrictions placed on the materials. Um, as we come across them, there might be some names that are crossed out that are just not legible and that's just a matter of working with archival materials. So, um, yeah. So um, here's the question. So given that, and this is whoever wants to answer this question, given that Maskoub was a critic of the Tude Party, how is his relationship with the Iranian People's Democratic Party, as uh, Democratic Mardom Heron, and Babak Amir Khosravi, and why didn't he join that party? Um, let me take a, a stab at the initial part of this question <clears throat> because it's part of uh, uh, my paper. Uh, I think he has a very interesting uh, uh, approach to the Tudor to the party. Uh, he tries to posit a different reading of the Tudor history. Uh, the traditional readings of Tudor history is either the advocates of Tudor party, which are all in 100%, this was the embodiment of salvation, or the anti the party people who say this was a tool of the Soviet Union and it was the embodiment of dogmatism. And Meskoub says uh, there was really two Tudor parties. There was a Tudor party of Ruzbe, of which is very critical. And there's a Tudor party of K1, of which is very praiseful. He tries to resurrect from that tradition 
what is commensurate with his idea of modernity, a secular, democratic, rational, individualistic future for Iran. If there are elements within the Tudor party that can help that, he's willing to uh, bring, bring it forth as he does in his book on uh, Kayvan, as he does in all of his writings. At the same time, he's equally unabashed in criticizing it for uh, uh, its dogmatism and criticizing it, I, I must say, uh, for having the same kind of uh, structure of ideas as dogmatic religion has. Uh, we must read his views on to the party along with his brilliant critique of Islam as it is practiced in the Islamic Republic of Iran. There are two sides of the same coin. There are two sides of a coin that says uh, a, a rationalism, a temporal thinking, anti-individualist thinking, dogmatic thinking, your belief in sacred books that cannot be questioned will beget us nothing but despotism. And uh, how he dealt with uh, uh, Mr. Khosravi, who has written very critically of that history is something as a part of his personal history that I'm not uh, aware of. Well, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so another question that we have that's come up and there's a couple questions that fit in with the same, with the same theme. And this is the broader question of considering the crucial role of the Shah Name in Persian culture, how do we analyze it its role in light of the situation and the question said in light of the terrible situation we Iranians find ourselves in our in our uh, culture uh, now and in a related question kind of on the same theme um, do you think that Mr. Muscoob's reading of the Shah Nama may overcome the leftists in the long run and can it help Iranian society to read the Shah Nami in a more historical and social context uh, relevant and relevant to the to current their current society. So for any of you who want to jump in um, in kind of addressing this of you know what do we do with the, how do we in looking at the Shah Nami, how can it in terms of looking at it in light of contemporary Iranian society today? Um, may I suggest that maybe <clears throat> Professor Bezai can uh, answer this because this sort of dovetails with where he ended. من ممکنه که جوابم یکی از مطالب یعنی دقیقاً اونی که شما انتظار داشته باشید نباشه ولی من فکر میکنم که یه چیز مهمی که توی شاهنامه ندیده گرفته میشه یا شده اینه که در قبال همه ادبیات ایران که در مسائل روحی عرفانی غیره 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 هر چی هستن عاشقانه چطور هر چی هستن شاهنامه صدها فیگور و صدها کاراکتر ساخته چیزی که ما هرگز نداشتی این uh, it says, I, I, I'll answer it, but uh, I don't think you, uh, you might, my answer might be necessarily uh, what you expect. <clears throat> of course, we always expect with Professor Bezai to give the unexpected answer. That's the brilliance of his uh, answers. So <clears throat> he says, uh, what is uh, evident, in, what is uh, in Shahname and hasn't been paid much attention to uh, is that while the rest of Iranian literature is steeped in mysticism, steeped in love stories, steeped in these kinds of matters. Shah Nome has created hundreds of characters. This is something we've never had in our literature, the creation of characters. The point that is very important is that Shah Nome is with the people and the characters, and with the characters, and with the characters, and with the characters, and with the تأثیر داره روی اتفاقات این چیزی که ما نداریم جای دیگه 
uh, the, the important point is that uh, in Shahnameh, we are faced with characters, multiple characters, individuals. We are given the details of events, details of how these events have impacted subsequent events. This kind of a detail, this kind of attention to these kinds of details is what we don't have in uh, uh, the rest of our literature. برای فقط یک مثال خیلی ساده و خیلی کوچک داستان رسام سهرا که همه جا تقلیل داده میشه به اینکه پدری که پسر را اش را کشت جز جز اینکه چگونه اتفاقات سیاسی اجتماعی خودناشناسی ها قفلت ها غیره 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 یه همچین واقعی رو به وجود میاره یعنی نادانی ما Uh, let me give you uh, a simple example. It's the story of uh, Rostamo Sohra, the most famous stories in uh, Shahnameh. Again, for those who might not know, uh, Sohra is uh, Rostam's son. Uh, this story has been commonly uh, reduced to the uh, story of a father killing his son, the story of a filicide. Uh, but in reality, the story is full of uh, Uh, instances of social history, political development, uh, missed opportunities, failures to recognize oneself, failures to recognize our own uh, ignorances and our own faults. من فکر می‌کنم که مطالعات دکتر مسکو مسکو همه در جاول ولی آغاز یک مطالعه است. ما هنوز شاهنامه رو در آغاز مطالعه شیم. یعنی مطالعه خودش تا حالا هر چی بود در اطرافش یا افتخار بود یا نفیه حالا بهتره که بریم جلو و خودشو بخونیم uh, I think uh, uh, what Mr. Mescoub has done in the realm of uh, uh, Shahnameh has been very good uh, first rate but it is the beginning of the work not the end of the work we have to begin the task of reading the text in themselves. Hitherto, we have talked around the book. Some have taken pride in it, some have panned it, uh, some have, uh, but it is uh, uh, time to go beyond negation and praise, but read the text themselves and begin to uncover their meanings. و کسانی که در ایران زندگی میکنن کسانی هر کدوم یک موضوع رو توی شاهنامه دنبال کنن حالا در این جلسه اون چه صحبت شد رو من فقط بگم مثلا نقش استبداد دینی در شاهنامه شما میدونه که اونا حتی در مشاور زحاکن و بر ادالت اون منشور بنویسن حتی گفته میشه بزرگان ایران چه جوری این کشور رو به اون میدن زحاک پدرش مرد دینی مرداس و اهریمن اونو دگرگون میکنه این اهریمن یک اهریمن بیرونی نیست یک اهریمن درونیه من فکر میکنم اصلا ناچاری این که شاهنامه رو از نو پیدا کنیم معنا کنیم داستان خیلی مثل داستان زاب این اون همه هر کدومش باید از نو در طرف اسطوره شناسی شناخته بشه اینا قصه فقط نیستن یا تاریخ هیچ داستانی در شاهنامه نیست که یک جوری بخشی از اسطوره توی اون منعکس نشده باشه و به تاریخ نیامیخته باشه و داره جدا کرد تاریخش رو توضیح داد و اسطورش رو جدا داد که کجا میاد و معنیش چی بوده من فکر کنم ما در سراغاز یک شناختیم و مسکوب یکی از قدم های بلنده من به کس دیگه ای که اینجا عدای احترام میکنم محمد جفر محجوب در نوارهایی که از او هم مونده در مورد چاه نامه uh, Uh, I think, in fact, I hope that there are people in the current generation of Iranians, people living in Iran or everywhere else, who will decide to take one aspect 
and study, study it in Shahnameh, study it according to what the text says. For example, uh, let me give one uh, instance of something that has been referred to in the course of this, uh, this discussion, and that is the issue of religious despotism in Shahnameh. Uh, we have to remember that some of the advisors of Zahak, again, for those who don't know Shahnameh, Zahak is this demonic force that comes from uh, Arabia and takes over Iran and kills uh, two Iranian youth every day to feed them. Uh, snakes on his shoulders. Uh, some of the advisors for Zahak uh, are religious people. They're, they're the religious they're leaders who write a text about his justice. They are uh, who help him cultivate this. Uh, they're the ones who uh, uh, help him uh, consolidate his uh, force. Uh, we have to remember that uh, the, the, one, uh, the hawk's father is overthrown, if I uh, uh, jotted this time correctly, by uh, 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 Ahriman, the embodiment of evil. Uh, we have to recognize that part of this Ahriman, part of this uh, demon is inside us. We need to reinterpret Shahnameh. We need to reinterpret it uh, in light of our understanding of mythology. There is no story in Shahnameh that is not at once a combination of hit, myth, and history. We have to closely read this. We have to discern the parts that is mythology, the parts that is history, and we have to find the inner meanings of these things. It isn't enough to just uh, read the story. Uh, Meskoub's work was a very good beginning in this process. And while praising Meskoub, I have to also mention the work of Jafar Muhammad Mahjoub, uh, Muhammad Jafar Mahjoub, uh, the great Iranian scholar who uh, lived in this area, passed away several years ago, whose uh, work, also available on tape, on Shah Naumeh, is very much worthy of attention. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bazayi, for, for your response to that. Uh, this is a question for. Um, for Professor uh, Manu Azizi, how does Maskoub's view of the Persian language in relation to a national Iranian identity change in the course of his productive career, particularly after writing his deeply essentialistic long essay on Persian and Iranian identity? Well, I think it's, it's a complicated um, question. Um, the emphasis on the Persian language um, as the basis for Iranian cultural identity um, extends over his entire um, career. Um, he became more and more uh, uh, concerned with that, um, dealt with it, uh, in a more uh, uh, detailed fashion, particularly in his book, uh, Meliat um, Bazabon. Uh, but he was also aware, um, I think particularly in the, the last decade of his life, um, that this idea of, uh, of Persian-ness or the Persian basis of identity um, could be used um, as a way of excluding um, speakers of other tongues, of other uh, languages. So he was very careful um, in promoting Persian as a basis for Iranian identity, not to become an exclusivist, not to otherize, so to speak, uh, speakers of other languages. Um, in fact, he was very explicit in, uh, in saying that uh, whereas Persian can be the lingua franca, that certainly um, education could be in the mother tongues of uh, each members of, of members of each community, um, or that uh, uh, you know uh, any kind of official communications could indeed take place, um, uh, you know, within the local uh, language or languages. Uh, but for linguistic minorities in Iran, when they want to 
converse with each other when they want to relate to other speakers of other languages, obviously the lingua franca, uh, the Persian language should be the common language. Um, so if there was any change uh, in his view of Persian as a basis for Iranian identity, it was an appreciation and an emphasis on, uh, if you will, pluralism, um, that the emphasis on Persian should not be taken as a policy to exclude others, uh, to dominate uh, other uh, speakers of other uh, languages. So if you will, the move towards pluralism, um, I would say was something that he became more aware of um, in the final years of his, uh, his life and writings. Okay, thank you, Professor Banwazizi. Um, I think uh, Ms. Kosmayi had um, wanted to respond a little bit to the previous question um, and uh, Professor Bazayi in, in his uh, comments. So uh, Ms. Kosmayi, please. من میخواستم فقط یه نکته کوچیکی به دنبال صحبت‌های استاد بیزایی اضافه کنم که این دقیقا نگاه مسکوبم به شاهنامه از همین دست بود مسکوب من به خاطر دارم مدام تکرار میکرد که شاهنامه باید نقد ادبی بشه و این یه فکری بود که داشت و خودش این کار رو در بخشی از برخی از جلسات کلاس آغاز کرده بود مثلا گاهی دو روایت رو با هم مقایسه میکرد من یادداشتایی دارم مثلا روایت کوتاهی که هیچ نوع سوسپنسی درش نیست یا روایت طولانی که چطوری فردوسی با سوسپنس کار میکنه اینها رو میگفت نسل جوان باید با ابزار نقد اروپایی یعنی از مکتب های نقد ادبی اروپایی استفاده کنه و شاهنامه رو به گونه دیگه بخونه و نقد کنه Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, so one of the other um, let me, questions... Uh, let me uh, translate what you said. Okay. <clears throat> Unless uh, you you don't want to translate it. <laughs> it's okay. Go ahead. There's some people. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to add uh, one uh, point to what Professor Beza, you said. Uh, I think that was precisely the uh, same look that uh, the scoop had. Uh, more uh, than once I heard him say during the course of these seminars that we need to have, uh, and we need to look at Shahnameh from uh, the prism of literally criticism. Uh, in some of his classes, for example, he would compare two of the stories of Shahnameh and compare them from a literally prism and say this one, for example, uses the trope of suspense. In this other one, there is no suspense. More than once, he said that the younger generation must use uh, modern, uh, he said, European tools of literary criticism and using them, reread the Shahnameh and deconstruct it through that uh, point of view. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, this is for Professor Frochfal. Um, there are not many authors and intellectuals who are open to share their vulnerabilities and failures with others. Maskub definitely does so in Ruzha Darra. How do you relate his openness to Maskub's, this openness to Maskub's personality? And what do you think was the main reason of this openness? Uh, would you repeat the uh, openness uh, of Meskub or uh, openness of the book? Uh, I, I, uh... The, the question um, says that Meskub was very open and vulnerable about his failures, um, particular in uh, Ruzha da Ra. Mm -hmm. And how do you relate this openness to his personality? And why do you think he was... Um, being so open and, and vulnerable? Uh, this, uh, you know, we are all vulnerable in exile and, and, and uh, we have been actually. 
And the most part of the Ruzhad Ra is the accounts of um, a scoop uh, life in ex living in exile. So uh, I remember one uh, note uh, or comment by him. He wrote that today I woke up and again I asked myself, what should I have to do from now on? This, this is a, a, a question that all the, uh, uh, or um, I mean, people exile, the exiles know about it and experience, experience it uh, the, uh, uh, in uh, their life that uh, this um, very situation uh, uh, of uh, being in exile and uh, being an uh, exile. So uh, personally, I I try to read most part of the Ruzdada Ra, uh, Meskub uh, diaries in exile. It has been my impression, and uh, I hope that I answer properly to this question. Thank you. Any of the rest of you have any any thoughts on on that question? Can I, can I say a couple of words, uh, Ryan? <clears throat> yes, I, I think his sense of vulnerability uh, comes from his uh, quintessential modernity, uh, his uh, dedication to being a modern individual, uh, and this, in a way, connects what uh, Professor Bezay was saying and what's in the uh, Ms. Kasmai's very wonderful paper about uh, Ms. Goob's whole lifetime effort being a sense, essentially a search for the self. But the, uh, the self he is looking for is not a hagiographic self, whether hagiography in the sense of a religious uh, saint character or hagiography in the sense of a religious uh, leftist dogmatic character. These heroic figures, uh, proletarian leaders who are all greatness and no foibles. He has his foibles. He is not uh, averse to letting everyone know, and he is willing to share them. He is not willing to, uh, he's un not unwilling to share his anxiety about death. He is not unwilling uh, to share his uh, love of woman, his passion for woman, the place of woman in his life, the doubts that he's had. So all of this goes, and this is evident in the collection that he's prepared. This is not a hagiographical collection. This is not a collection of papers that only confirm his greatness and his heroism. It confirms his heroism, his brilliance, but also his doubts, his failures, his failed loves, all of these things. That is exactly what uh, 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 Ms. Kasmohi says he was like Montaigne. Uh, Montaigne talks about himself uh, foibles and failures and accomplishments all in one. And if I may just add a sentence or two to that, um, it really began not in exile, but in his last year when he was in prison. Um, and it was at that time that he came to this realization that he had to be to free himself, to emancipate himself from any kind of formulaic, any kind of ideological understanding of the world of Iran and of himself and his role um, in society. Um, and he's very explicit about this, that I need to be honest with myself and I need to find myself. One other quick comment um, about women in his life. Um, let's not forget that the greatest woman um, for him in his life was his mother. Um, and the debt that he owed to his mother and not to his father, by the way, uh, which is very explicit and, uh, and a very powerful voice um, in the rest of his life. And he admitted that many times in many different forms and quite emotionally. Um, so I think that's uh, just a, a, as an addition to uh, what Professor Milani uh, said um, in his comments. Thank you for, for those comments. Um, here's a broad question. 
And the question is, why do you think no such celebration of Muscoob's life and work happened during his lifetime? How was he viewed during his lifetime and has that changed since his passing? Well, first of all, it is true um, what uh, the um, questioner, the point that the questioner has raised, that um, there is clearly, there has been clearly a much greater appreciation uh, of Ms. Goob after he passed away in 2005 than, than before. Uh, but uh, he really was liked, revered, loved uh, by people who knew him. He had many friends and uh, many admirers, uh, but the kind of more public appreciation really began um, after his death. And it seemed like he was more present um, among all of us um, after he passed away. His voice became even more relevant as I think one of you pointed out. Uh, when we read him today, I think it was um, Professor Bezai who mentioned that, that uh, or, or I'm not quite sure, um, that there is a, uh, a presence of him and a relevance of him today um, that people didn't feel at the time that he was um, living. His words resonate more with us today than they did at the time. Uh, Professor Ganun Parvar. I yeah, think. I mean, something which is which has happened after uh, Meskub's death, uh, uh, it has to do with they're talking about identity, and he wanted to know what his identity was. This identity is not Meskub himself, personally. It is, we're talking about collective identity. I think this is a question, a postmodern question right now. Uh, it's not uh, I individual as Mescu, it is who am I as a product of this culture? Uh, so I think th this this should be added to what uh, Dr. Ben Aziz said also. And I just uh, might add one sentence. I, I think, it, uh, uh, and I think this is implied in both of these last comments, Iranian society, uh, inside and outside, both, I think has had a major shift towards a kind of a notion of self, notion of identity, notion of intellectual curiosity, notion of the place of intellectual, the kind of intellectuals they want, uh, away from what existed in Iran before, towards a much more democratic, much more inclusive, much more individual-based uh, notion. And uh, as uh, uh, as Afaro Ford writes in his very insightful article, he was posthumous in this sense. He was like, like uh, Professor Bezai, like Ibrahim Golestan, uh, like uh, Zanderudi in painting. These were people who were ahead of the curve and seeing the curve that the Iranian society is now there. The Iranian society is rediscovering its organic intellectuals and Miskub is one of the most brilliant organic intellectuals as is Bezai, as is Golestan, as is Zenderudi, uh, as uh, are you, uh, as is Banu Azizi, as Fal Rokhfal, Ms. Kasmai. I may, and I uh, do this with some reluctance taking again time, but I want to add one other element um, that, uh, that emphasizes uh, Ms. Koub's relevance to us and to Iranians more generally. Um, he was not um, taken by the um, anti-Western, uh, you know, the uh, West toxification Qarb Zadigi uh, thesis. Um, and his position on that issue is very clear, very explicit, and uh, was held all along. I remember at one time um, I, I had this conversation with him uh, that when Al Ahmad's um, book, not the book, but the pamphlets came out around 1963-64 on Qarab Zadegi, which later was put together in the form of a book. Um, there was a, you know, a gathering of a number of uh, very prominent Iranian uh, writers and intellectuals to celebrate uh, what Al Ahmad had achieved. 
And uh, uh, Al Ahmad went to Mesku, and as those of you who knew Al Ahmad, uh, remember he had a very special way of, of talking, calling everyone Rais. So Rais, what's your opinion about the book? Uh, so Meskoub said, well, it's an interesting book. He said, no, no, I want to know your, your, your uh, critical views. And he said that, uh, you know, Jalal, um, I think the book is very Arab Zadeh, West Strong, um, which is really a remarkable comment. Um, Meskoub's position was that, uh, you know, uh, in spite of all the faults that we can all enumerate um, for the West and the Westerners themselves are very much aware of it. And indeed, they passed on to us many of those critiques of their own civilizations. Um, that this is also a civilization that has produced, you know, uh, Plato, uh, Cervantes and Dante and, and so on and so forth, uh, as well as, of course, modern science and technology. We cannot afford to ignore that uh, civilization. We cannot turn away from that civilization and take refuge in um, our traditions. No, we should approach it critically. Uh, as Farouri said, we should go to the West with our heads, uh, not with our hearts or, you know, kicking the West and, and so on. Uh, and his view was that no culture, no civilization can ignore other civilizations. We all have something to learn from them and they have something to learn from us. So he had this view, a view which I think Iranians find much more measured, much more appealing, much more relevant in their contemporary, uh, you know, struggles uh, and in their contemporary politics, uh, um, if you will. So this is maybe one other reason why Mesku seems to be more relevant. He was not part of that, uh, you know, uh, nativist uh, crowd uh, that dominated the entire Iranian intellectual life um, in the late 1960s and 1970s. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Professor Bazai, this is a question, are there things that you disagree with uh, as far as Maskoub's interpretation of the Shah Name? And could you talk maybe about a couple of disagreements you have in relationship to his interpretation of the Shah Nameh. من سوالو برای خانم بله 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 فکر کنم گفتن آیا مواردی هست که شما با تحلیل آقای مسکو و شاهنامه مخالفید بفرمایید نه من هیچ موردی نیست که با تحلیل مسکو مخالف باشم ولی فکر می کنم که بعضی وقتا بعضی ها هنوز جا دارن که پرورده چند یا اینکه از جوانه و دیگه هم بهشون نگاه کرده بشه این چیزیه که در بوده چه خودم فکر میکنم هم فکر میکنم یعنی نه اینکه این فقط مخصوص اوست ولی من با تحلیل های اون مخالفتی ندارم در بعضی موارد فکر میکنم شاید بهتر بود از این بود یا اون بود هم بهش نگاه کرده می شد این معنی مخالفت نیست به معنای گسترش دادن معلومات ما راجع به یک چیزه problem, different uh, dimensions to the same problem. This, of course, is not limited to his interpretations. This also holds true for my own interpretations. They too need to be looked at from maybe different angles. I don't disagree with any of his interpretations. Uh, it is just that I wish that they can be developed further. Uh, I don't disagree with any of them. I simply hope that and think that we can expand upon them and they can be looked at from through different prisms. من فکر می کنم که شاید شاید حالا آینده این کارو خواهد کرد ولی تا این لحظه ای که ما هستیم شاید 
میشه شاهنامه رو در چارچوب این که مال گذشته بود قرار نداد و میشه فکر کرد که چجوری الان داره کار میکنه من متاسفانه ناچرم اینجا از یک تا کار خودم اسم برم که خوشحال نیستم از این در دیباچه نوین شاهنامه یا در سیاوچ خانی یا در اون رسام سهراب اون, اون کاری که کردم سهراب کشی و غیره سعی کردم اونا را یک مرتبه از نگاه امروزی یا سعی نکردم خود به خود شده که از یک نگاه دیگه نگاه کنم و اونا تبدیل بشن به تصویرهای از امروز شاهنه به نظر من یه جور آینه است که ما را هنوز داره نشون میده این اشتباهات فقط مال گذشته نیست این اشتباهات در ما داره تکرار میشه متاسفانه به خاطر اینکه ما چیزی نیاموختیم از شاهنامه و چیزی نیاموختیم از اشتباهات بود I think maybe uh, anyway the future will do it but maybe uh, in our own time uh, we can uh, read uh, the Shahnameh not as a tale of the past uh, but as something that uh, is relevant today we should see how it would work as a, a, a reflection of our own time I, I don't want to refer to my own work but I have tried to do this in the, a few of my own writings, for example, a new introduction to Shahnameh, the story of uh, 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 Sohrab, the death of Sohrab or Sohrab, uh, the, the killing of Sohrab. I have tried to do, essentially look at these uh, from a contemporary perspective. I have seen them as an image of today. We should look at Shahnameh as a mirror of ourselves, as a mirror of our time. it is still very effective in showing our own faults. We have not learned from the mistakes of the past. This is not a story about the past. It is the story that is constantly being repeated and it is being repeated because we have not learned the lessons that was in it and uh, implied in the stories. <laughs> uh, Ms. Kosmai, I think you had, had raised your hand. من میخواستم یه نکته رو اشاره کنم که میبینم خب این محبوبیت مسکوب امروز به خصوص میان نسل جوان چه در ایران چه در افغانستان و باستابش رو در فضای مجازی که میبینیم بیشتر به شکل نقل قول از مسکوب یعنی چون مسکوب یکی از بهترین استوارترین زیباترین در این حال ساده ترین نصرای فارسی رو می نوشت و خالق این نصر بود و فکر میکنم یکی از عواملی که با محبوبیت مسکوب در روزگار ما همین نصرشه که باعث شده پلی باشه با این نصر جوان من زیاد نمیگم که شما بتونید ترجمه کنید uh, I, I want to add one more point uh, about uh, the reason for the popularity of Mescoop in Iran and Afghanistan particularly amongst the youth if you look at uh, the places where he is often quoted for example in the social media uh, one of the things that is fascinating is how often his own words are quoted in other words because he has written in one of the most beautiful, the most pristine, one of the most pure uh, proses of modern Iran. He has created a new style of prose that is easy to uh, connect with. It has made him uh, very popular. He has become essentially a bridge that can connect this generation. And uh, part of his popularity is the beauty of his uh, uh, prose. اما نکته ای که اینجا هست اینی که فکر نمی کنم مسکوب راضی بود که اینجوری خونده بشه برای اینکه بیشتر از مسکوب مثل کلمات قصار مسکوب مدام تکرار میشه بازنویسی میشه بدون اینکه شاید حتی البته این حدس منه حتی مثلا اون متنی که فلان جمله زیبا درش آمده کامل خونده بشه و فکر میکنم این برخوردی نیست که مسکوب میپسندید به کارهاش 
and the, the point is that uh, I'm not sure, uh, I can be certain, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, Ms. Koub wanted to be read this way. Uh, he is often treated as someone who writes aphorisms uh, and many of these aphorisms are coded uh, without uh, attention, do, do attention to the entire text whence they have come from. I don't think this kind of a reading of him uh, was something that he approved of. All right, thank you. Um, so it looks like we have just a little bit over five minutes. So I'm gonna put a couple questions out here at once and whoever wants to jump in and answer these questions. So one of them is who are, um, Within the generations coming after Maskub, who are the few, who are the people you think can carry his torch forward? So that's one of them. And then we have this other question from a resident who says, as a resident and a political refugee in France, how do you suppose Maskub would respond to the present beheading in France in the name of Islam? Uh, I have. Uh, uh... Let me begin by saying that I think he would have been abhorrent about the brutality of these, and he would have been unabashed to condemn it for what it is, which is absolute brutal murder. There is no other word for it. Uh, I, he defended the rights of people for, to speak their minds. He himself spoke his mind although he was afraid of the same brutal murderers who kill opponents but in, and wrote his critique of Islam under a pseudonym. But I think he would have been first to say, this is condemnable, this is shameful, this is disrespectful to the democratic tradition that has given you asylum and you're now using it to create terror uh, in Europe. It's the same kind of terror that he condemned when it was used against Kasravi, to whom he is indebted, it is the same kind of terror that he condemned in every other instance. He would have been, I think, in the forefront of saying enough is enough. And does anyone have any comments on um, who are individuals you think can carry this torch of Muscoob uh, forward? in the younger generations? I say something. I think it's going to be in, uh, not necessarily intellectuals of Meskoub's kind. They're going to be in the form of novelists, poets. Uh, this is going to be the uh, future. I mean, right now, I, I, and I'm more siding with novelists, uh, with the stuff that's coming out of Iran even now, despite all the censorship, they're brilliant uh, works. And a lot of these ideas are, are woven into the texture of the texts. I would only add uh, filmmakers to your list. I think many of them are carrying that, that mission in their own way, in their own artistic uh, form. Uh, but I very much agree with what you said, uh, Dr. Khan Abak. So I would like to leave, uh, we have a few minutes left, but I thought this would be a good time for any of you who feel that there's something important that you would like to say. I wanna thank every, all the viewers who have submitted their questions. I apologize that we haven't been able to get to all of the questions, um, but I do hope that these conversations can continue going forward. And maybe, you know, in the future, um, it would be nice if we could have an actual in-person event um, on the campus of Stanford in Green Library, where we can, you know, uh, view some of the actual physical materials from the archive and continue the conversation. But I would like to leave the last couple of minutes for any of you who would like to share any kind of last thoughts or, or last words. I just thought something. Uh, I think, uh, despite the fact that uh, he worked a lot on, on the Shah Nameh. His book on Hafez is, in my opinion, the most brilliant book written about, uh, written, written on the poetry of Hafez. I, do not, I don't really think it is, it is not even, uh, it's not, 
it's not conventional scholarship, even in the Western, uh, Western sense. Of course, it's not in the Iranian sense because Iran, the Iranian sense is basically uh, uh, digging graves. Uh, but here, his reading of it, his reading of the poetry of Hafez is absolutely unique. Uh, and I think uh, it, it will uh, have an effect on our understanding of Hafez for years to come. I would just like to add um, another um, aspect of um, his legacy. Um, it, it seems to me that um, one of the qualities that uh, Ms. Goop had, um, in addition to being self-critical and very honest and open and forthcoming about his own views of himself, you know, he used to carry around a notebook, a small notebook with him anywhere that he went and he would write down um, his impressions. What I think distinguished him from some of the other intellectuals of his generation was the very critical view that he had about the Iranian culture and the need to engage in self-criticism and not only taking pride in Ferdowsi and our past or our you know, Islamic traditions, whatever, uh, but also attending to the faults of our culture, to the shortcomings of our culture, to the fact that, as he used to say, you know, we have had 2,500 years of relationship with the Greeks, but there is no direct translation, at least at the time that he was making this statement. I don't know whether the, anyone has translated from Greek into Persian. Uh, there has been no translation um, from uh, Greek into Persian. Uh, that says something about our lack of curiosity about um, other cultures. So the willingness to be self-critical and critical of Iranian culture uh, was also another tribute that I think needs to be paid to, uh, to Mescu. And I think the last, <clears throat> maybe the last uh, tribute to Mescu is that it's because uh, of his important legacy that such a wonderful group of scholars uh, accepted our invitation, uh, kept with us when we couldn't have a, a meeting at uh, Stanford, submitted their uh, papers online, uh, worked up with us to tape them. Uh, it speaks to his uh, uh, influence, to his humanity. I want to again uh, thank uh, Professor Kamshad uh, for entrusting this rather remarkable collection to us. In preparing this conference, uh, I uh, ask him many uh, questions and advice. I asked Ms. Kasmoi for some advice. I asked uh, my dear friend Ali Banu Azizi for advice. I'm very much indebted to all of them. And most important of all, uh, I am very uh, much, I think we, we are all indebted to Roma Parhat and Franco Arico, whose tireless work made all of this possible. And one last word before I forget, uh, I'm very grateful that um, Professor Bezai uh, accepted uh, my insistent uh, invitation to participate in this. As he says in his paper, he doesn't consider himself an expert on uh, Mescu, but uh, I knew that his presence would be absolutely indispensable in this conference. And thank you all for accepting uh, our invitation and making this such a, for me, a wonderful learning experience. <laughs>